Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Cloopstick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time so that you don't have to. This week, another magic item or rather magic technology and culture topic in our magic item series. Full disclosure, this video is inspired by a conversation on the Sages of Greyhawk group on Facebook. The Sages group are each dedicated to specific settings and I am one of the admins overseeing all of the Sages network on that platform. So I encourage you to join and just talk about the deeply nerdy stuff. Avoid the controversy of other more mainstream groups. Just discuss the topics and settings you're interested in. And they're a good place to ask questions and not get trolled for it, but actually have researched answers provided. So the topic today is in regard to ridiculous armor. And before I talk Talk about what provokes this topic, let me go at it in reverse and answer you the question before we actually ask the question. In a high fantasy world, where magical enchantments placed on armour and weapons is more commonplace, it is a legitimate tactic to heavily enchant some relatively light and mobile armour, but deliberately leave it cut back and ridiculously lacking in its physical protection from a purely visual point of view. A fighter going into combat with a pack of less intelligent enemies who see only an opponent who is apparently badly protected will charge in with confidence to cut them down in preference to anyone else. Anyone who plays games online with groups will know that this is called kiting and drawing in enemies and then tanking or soaking up the damage to protect more vulnerable uh, ranged casters and sneaky fighters who are better at dishing out damage than taking it themselves is a very good tactic. For example, a suit of leather armor provides an armor class of 11 plus the wearer's dexterity modifier, so say that's plus 2 and they have an armor class of 13. Leather armor only really consists of a breastplate and shoulder protectors and the rest of it is just leather clothing. However, Combine that with an enchantment, you can boost it to legendary, which is plus 3 to the armor class. Armor of invulnerability will give resistance to all non-magical damage while it is worn, and you can stack a ring of protection for another plus 1 armor class, a cloak of displacement, etc. There is loads of debate about the various combinations of a person wearing no armor, for example, someone wearing braces of defense while also enchanted with mage armor spells. But the point is, the character is beefed up on invisible armor while appearing to be woefully vulnerable as a legitimate combat strategy in a magic rich environment. And I welcome the debate which is very likely to ensue in the comment section on this video because there certainly should be a lively sharing of ideas about how this would work and also because I'm sick and tired of the question. So here is the reason I feel the need to point out the magic defense tactic. Dungeons and Dragons is not medieval Europe. The armor is often very similar, yes, but we did not have magic in our world, nor do we have regenerating trolls, armor-piercing manticore tail spikes, rust monsters, wraiths, green slime, rot blood grubs, or supernatural creatures from other planes of existence and exotic damage dealing capabilities. Yet time and again, I see the same people aggressively objecting to any depiction of a poorly armored person in fantasy artwork, and not once have I seen these people mention magic. You cannot divorce Dungeons and Dragons from magic and compare everything in it to the past of our world. Even then, it's not ancient earth. I may be able to use a laser pointer to set a match on fire this in this day and age, but I couldn't they, they couldn't do that back in the 13th century. People on Toral can set a town on fire just by waving their hands in the air, talking funny and sprinkling a bit of batshit and sulfur. They know that magic exists, they know it is a huge advantage and they know how to, it can prove to be a superior form of protection in a larger set of situations that they may face in their highly variable, high fantasy, high magic environment. Consider if you will, the universe of Star Trek. Those ships get torn apart if they lose power because they rely almost entirely on inertial dampeners, deflectors and energy shields. They do not bulk up their ships with heavy armor because the energy shields are far more effective, adaptable and replenishable. And it makes perfect sense that these people who have access to magical energy shields would come to the exact same conclusion. In Dindy, there's a bit of a spectrum to this. The elves, a very old civilization with a lot of martial traditions, favor speed, mobility, and more magical protection than physical armor. The dwarves have no problem with enchanting their armor and weapons, but prefer to keep their very heavy armor just in case the magic fails, because they have a very long history in going up against opponents who can shut down or avoid their magical defenses. Humans form the middle ground. They are all they, they are all about variety, adaptation, and individual choices. Some go the way of the dwarves, some the way of the elves, but most just stay in the middle with an eye toward being as mobile as they can while being as protected as possible by both magic and physical armor. Even so, they will toss aside the shield if it means that they can do more damage with two-blade, two-handed weapons. Gnomes, and to a lesser extent halflings, are more likely to opt for full magical defense. But this is dangerously close to a gross generalization. I merely suggest 
it is more likely, and you really don't see a lot of gnomes wearing full plate mail. One issue I have with Dungeons & Dragons treatment of magical armour though, is where are all the old suits of armour? Time and time again, we, and we all know this, it's said that magical armour and weapons are tougher than non-magical web items. They don't corrode, they're less likely to be damaged in combat. I mean, it's really the whole point of enchanting the item in the first place, so that it's they are superior and far more useful. I know that most characters will start off with mundane equipment and be very focused on finding or being able to purchase some magical items replacements as soon as possible. And they will most likely replace those items with even better ones as time has gone on, and they gain more fame and skill at their trade. So the market for magic items is being added to all the time, not just with artisans and mages making new items on a regular basis, but also from the fact that these items are sought after and tend not to wear out. So the items should be more and more common as time goes on because they're brought back into circulation. People actively go out looking for them, to the point that even your average family will have a number of magical items just kicking around in the basement or attic. And there will be lots of shops with old enchanted items for sale. Blacksmiths will have piles of them handed in for scrap metal, and they are loath to smelt down and waste such um, items of perfectly good magical weapons and armour. It is less logical that magic items, weapons and armour are not more commonplace in Dungeons and Dragons settings, much more so than the fact that quite a few warriors will be wandering around in armour that is more a fashion statement and invitation to stupid brutes to attack them than otherwise sensible looks looking suits of full protection, bulky, hot and uncomfortable as they are. This is not Earth. These people know what they're doing and the fact that civilised races have even survived at all comes down to their ability to use any advantage they can, and magic is a huge advantage. Mostly. Not looking at you, Netheral Empire. So we're coming up on 40,000 subscribers to the channel by the Emperor, a special number. And it's time for me to replace my original 5th edition Monster Manual. So I thought I would give away my old one with all my little pencil notes on hit point totals from the actual combat encounters where I use the monsters and games. And I'll also sign it and add some special notes for whoever gets the book to enjoy. Obviously there is some wear and tear, but also to ensure the book is um, good, I'll repair it and it'll be good for many years of use. Details of how this book will be given away are yet to be decided. I'd actually appreciate your ideas on, the, um, on that down below. Just don't say give it to me, you jokesters. I know some of you will. Thank you so much for getting me this far. I am enjoying every minute I put uh, into these videos and the hours every day reading and replying to your comments. I give a lot, but I receive so much more from you and all in return, and thank you. You really have, uh, we've, we've only just begun, and there is so much more left to explore, and I hope you stick around for the ride. This is a Patreon exclusive video. You got it way in advance of anyone else. If you're watching it now on YouTube, I recorded and uploaded this earlier this month and have just now released it for everyone else to enjoy. Take a moment, if you would, to hit all the buttons. Check out my Patreon because uh, perhaps check out my merch on Teespring. Perhaps get a subscription to Patron Blades and get yourself a regular supply of fantastic razors. I really enjoy mine. And if you do use my link, it helps me out a little bit as well. So thanks for listening, everyone. As always, I'll be back with more for you very soon.